I'm Joe Kirkendall. And we're here at New Life North, one of New Life's eight congregations, meeting in six locations and speaking three languages right here in Colorado. Hey, New Life, we're doing something called Parent Orientation. Our Family Ministries is putting this orientation together for parents of students and kids next, uh, actually this coming Sunday, during the nine o'clock and during the 11 o'clock service. There's already gonna be kids check-in for birth to fifth graders, and it's gonna be an opportunity for you parents to learn about the vision, some of the curriculum of what we're going to be going over, and a chance for you to learn about how you can get involved as a parent in our student and kids ministries. And we love staying connected to you, so make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We would love to be connected with you. And if you are just wondering what's going on in the church, you want to know about different events and things like that, 
make sure to go to our website at newlifechurch.org. We count it an honor to pray with you. So if you have a prayer request, make sure to submit that at nlcprayer.org. And New Life, we wanna thank you so much for the giving that you have brought generously to this house. We wanna thank you so much. Your generous giving allows us to meet the needs uh, of this church, of the Pikes Peak region, and our global ministry partners. So there's lots of ways to give, both online and here in person. And may the Lord bless our time together today. May you know that he sees you, that he knows you, he hasn't forgotten you. He knows every hair on your head and he is for you. Be blessed.
name is Beth. I'm Joe Kirkendall. And we're here at New Life North, one of New Life's eight congregations, meeting in six locations and speaking three languages right here in Colorado. At New Life, we're doing something called parent orientation. Our family ministries is putting this orientation together for parents of students and kids next, uh, actually this coming Sunday, during the nine o'clock and during the 11 o'clock service. There's already gonna be kids check in for birth to fifth graders, and it's gonna be an opportunity for you parents to learn about the vision, some of the curriculum of what we're going to be going over, and a chance for you to learn about how you can get involved as a parent in our student and kids ministries. And we love staying connected to you, so make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We would love to be connected with you. And if you are just wondering what's going on in the church, you want to know about different events and things like that, make sure to go to our website at newlifechurch.org. And we count it an honor to pray with you. So if you have a prayer request, make sure to submit that at nlcprayer.org. And New Life, we want to thank you so much for the giving that you have brought generously to this house. We want to thank you so much. Your generous giving allows us to meet the needs uh, of this church, of the Pikes Peak region, and our global ministry partners. So there's lots of ways to give, both online and here in person. And may the Lord bless our time together today. May you know that He sees you, that He knows you, He hasn't forgotten you. He knows every hair on your head and He is for you. Be blessed.
things that come to the surface when we stand before a holy God. The first one is, who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you in the heavens and in the earth? Who could stand against you? Who could compare? Who could fathom your greatness, O God? And the second question is this, who are we? Who am I to stand in your presence, O God? Who am I that you would reach down and pick me up out of the miry clay? Who am I that you would call me son or daughter? Who are we to stand before such a holy, awesome, great God? So with that in our minds and in our hearts today, in reverence and in all, let's worship our great God. For the Lord is strong and mighty. For the Lord is steadfast in love. For the Lord is matchless in glory. We are in awe. You're the one whose name is salvation. All your ways, all your ways are goodness and grace. So do anger full of compassion. We give you praise. We give you praise. God Almighty, King of majesty and mercy, earth and heaven, held together by your together you hold 
Amen. Hey, before we leave this moment, I'm going to ask you guys, we're going to sing that chorus just one more time, all right? Because here's the thing. I want to bring your attention to this line that we just sung. We said, with all creation, I sing. With all creation. What are, what are we talking about? Well, all creation, even though they would use different melodies maybe or different chords, they're, they're singing the same song. They're telling us the same thing. And scripture tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And, and what that's saying is if you and I were to see the night sky and we would see the, the stars up there, you know that even if we could travel at the speed of light, we would never even come close to approaching that little dot in the sky for the rest of our lives. What they're saying is there's something bigger. There's something bigger than you. There's something bigger than me out there. There's someone who spoke to bring this all to be. And it's not just out in the skies, it's, it's here. It's everywhere around us. The earth is full of his glory. And you would see it in the mountains that we get to see every single week living here in Colorado Springs. It's just so easy for us to know this. Um, you know, it snowed this week and I love when it snows because then it clears up at some point and you get to see the beauty of what God's created. And you see Pike Speak standing there firm with his fresh white robe that he just got, right? And, and what is it saying? What is it saying is the same thing. There's something greater. There's someone who's greater. And he's the one we're singing to today. And he's the one who's being praised right now in heaven where the angelic creatures that, that, that are around the throne room, you know what they're saying? They're saying God is holy, holy, holy. They could be saying anything. They could be saying that God is loving, loving, loving. And you know, that'd be true. That would be true. They could be saying that God is gracious, gracious, gracious. And that, that also would be true. But what they're saying is that he's set apart. He's just not like us in the sense that he's way bigger than anything we could have imagined. <laughs> And he's the God we're worshiping. So our worship starts with acknowledging him for who he is. So may it be that we get drawn into the same song today. See, the question is not, will the name of God be praised? The question is, will you praise the name of God today? Will you join in with that song of creation and say, I will give my yes. So across all this room, church, come on, we'll lift up our hands, we lift up our voice, and let's just sing that one more time and declare to the Lord, He is holy, holy, holy. Yes, Lord, we sing to you. Yes, you are holy, Jesus. You are holy, yeah, yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. worthy of that. He's worthy of that. Every single time we bring to him our worship, he's worthy of that. Hey, you know, this past week, uh, I got to go to Central America and uh, we got to visit some of the ministries that we're partnering with or considering partnering with. And it was just so awesome to get to see, to see people. Because so many times when we're thinking about what we're gonna to give to here as we get ready to give of our tithes and offerings, you think, well, I'm giving to you know, something out there. <laughs> and this is why it's so great for us to, to leave our little bubble here in Colorado Springs or even in the country. And I would just encourage you, if you get the chance, go. Go, because when you see faces, when you see people, you know what you're partnering with God to accomplish. I'll just tell you the short story. We went to uh, Honduras, and when we landed in the airport, the pastor of the church we were gonna visit picked us up. And as he was driving us to the hotel, he, uh, he was like, hey, and, and everything you see to your left and to your right, all that was underwater in 2020. 
And I was like, what, what, what happened? And it's just, it was a little embarrassing for me to find out that Honduras had been hit by two hurricanes in a matter of 15 days. And this is one of the, one of the downsides to a pandemic is like, all we hear about is COVID, right? And it's just like, is there anything else going on in the world? And I didn't even know that they had been hit twice in 15 days when normally they would have a hurricane every 20 years. And so it just destroyed this area, flooding everywhere. And a thousand people showed up at the doorstep of their church building at this church. And they said, we're here because we don't have a home anymore. And we don't have a place to go eat. We don't have doctors. And that church opened up their doors and they figured out how to put, you know, mattresses on the concrete floor so that these families could have a place to sleep that night. And they weren't prepared for that. They weren't ready for it, but the church stepped up. You know why? Because they love people because God loves people. That's what's on his heart. You wanna know what's on God's heart? It's people. And so today as we get ready to give, there are four ways and they're listed on the screen. This is what I want you to think about. Don't think about projects, don't think about plans, think about people. And what an amazing thing that we get to partner with God on the things he wants to do. We're not just bringing the good news of Jesus to the world, we're bringing the good of Jesus to the world. So let me pray for us as we, as we give. Father, man, we are so thankful to be called your children. We, we have no hope. And yet you spoke into the darkness of our lives and you said, let there be light. You brought us to life. And so as a thankful people, we now with that gratitude and with that joy in our hearts, we give Lord. We give to the things you're wanting to accomplish and the good you want to bring to the world through us, Lord, do it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. All right, let's continue worshiping the Lord. Can we just do a little, a little rhythmic clap, just like, you know, we're gonna take it back for a little bit of a second. In my heart, I'm still a seven-year-old at a Pentecostal church somewhere in Chicago. And we're gonna take it back to 91, the year of our Lord. Sing God of glory and power be into the ancient of days. From every nation, come on, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue, come on. And every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away. Sing it again, sing it again. Every tongue oh. in heaven and earth shall declare shall your glory. That was, that was written in 1991. Um, and uh, I was somewhere around three years old when that song came out. So, um, but I actually love that we had that today because we're talking about, you know, the greatness of all that creation singing. And then it kind of, it gets zoomed in a bit here in this song because it reminds us that God's name is to be praised not only in all the nations, all the earth, all creation, but also from generation to generation. And we want to do our part to, to raise children that would love the Lord and that would serve the Lord. And, uh, and that's what we're going to transition to here. We have a family who's going to dedicate their child. And uh, so first, we'd like to meet them. And then I just want to give a little context of what we're doing here today. So let's meet this family. Pastor Michelle. Yeah. Can you tell us your names and who you're dedicating today and how old he is? I'm Ashley, my husband Dylan, and then our three-year-old Kyson. So good. All right. Awesome. Well, here we have a family who they're coming forward to the front of the stage and what they're saying is uh, they wanna do their part. 
and they want to do what they can as parents, not perfectly. We're, no one's a perfect parent, but we're going to do as best as we can to lead our children in the ways of the Lord. But they're also doing it here at church because we're a part of this family too. Okay, so we do this at church because we're saying we're, we're coming alongside you guys. This, it takes an army to raise children. This isn't an easy task. And so we're going to need all the help we can get. And you know, the studies, recent studies are showing more and more that what affects adults so much in, later in life is what happens to them when they're children. Um, all the studies are just emphasizing this more and more. And it's amazing how things that get spoken over children affect them for the rest of their lives. So what we're saying here today is we wanna speak some different things over the children of our church. And so I'm gonna pray for them, but you, why don't you reach out your hand towards them too, and we're gonna to agree together in prayer that God would pour out his blessing here upon this family. So let's pray. Father, we are here because we are in need of you. You're the one who, who owns everything, who has all wisdom, power, and authority. And so God, we come to you with open hands asking, God, would you bless this family? Would you do what only you can do? May this child grow up and soon in his years that he would come to believe in Jesus Christ as his savior, that he would see what you have done, that to the lengths you have gone to bring us back to you. God, may we pray that over him. We pray that he would grow to be strong and that he would be a witness of what you wanna accomplish here on the earth and that he would be an ambassador of what you wanna do. God, let your kingdom continue to be presented to this world as we have a part in that and now this family too. And Lord, for those moments where they feel alone, we pray that they would reach out and they would find their church family with them. We pray that they would not only find the strength from you, but the strength from you through us, God. We're asking, let us be the vehicle of your grace to this family. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And in church, if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Let's encourage this family who's come forward. All right, well, before you take a seat, why don't you turn around, find someone you didn't come to church with and greet them. thing the text tells us is not only is the Word of God alive, but the Word of God changes us. The vocation of the Christian is to hear the call of the Spirit, to be an intercessor in whatever place God has positioned you. That's why we do what we do at New Life Church. Not to keep you busy, but to help you belong. All right, all right, all right. Good morning, New Life Church. Great to see you today. How's everybody feeling on this Sunday morning? <laughs> My name's Glenn Packiam. I serve as associate senior pastor here at New Life Church along with uh, Pastor Daniel. And I'm normally on most Sundays uh, hanging out at New Life Downtown. If you're new around here, you may not have realized this, but New Life Church is made up of eight congregations throughout the city. And uh, most Sundays I'm there at New Life Downtown. I also have the joy of uh, overseeing five of our congregations that meet all throughout the city that don't meet here on this campus. And one of those congregations is celebrating a birthday today. New Life East turns two years old today. Glory to God. Now, if, you, if you're doing the math, you're like, did we just launch a congregation right before a pandemic? Yes, indeed, we did. But by God's grace and the faithfulness of the saints, New Life East is flourishing. Uh, they're bigger than they were when we started, which is a wonderful thing. And our senior pastor, Pastor Brady Boyd, is preaching at New Life East this morning. So it, we extend their greetings, your greetings to them and all of that. Uh, would you pray with me this morning as we begin to open the scriptures? Father, we thank you for who you are. We ask now that as we open up your word and as we begin to explore what you're saying to us, that you would send your Holy Spirit again to renew his work in us. You would open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our minds, open up our hearts. Help us to see you and respond to you with our whole selves. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. 
You may not have heard anything I just said in the last few minutes because you were distracted by the fact that there is a cake on the platform. And it's awful close to lunchtime, and so you're thinking, what are you doing, Glenn? Why did you bring a cake? It's not just any cake. It is a chocolate cake. Now, if, I know I, the best kind. Now, if we had some, you know, sort of food judges here, let's say we were able to find Paul and Mary from the Great British Bake Off, anybody, and we said, Paul, Mary, t taste a bit of this cake. Maybe they'll say, oh, yes, well, it's got a hint of sugar in it, and maybe a bit of butter, and probably a bit too dry, actually. And then and if, and if there was in the house today a food scientist, you might be able to go a step further and analyze it under the microscope and you might be able to test it out and say, I think this cake was baked at 325 degrees in the oven. And actually, if you were a really good food scientist, you might say, Glenn, this cake came from a box, didn't it? <laughs> and you might be able to tell me all these details about the cake and you might be able to tell me a lot of the how questions, how the cake was made, what's in it. But you know what you wouldn't be able to tell me? You wouldn't be able to tell me who made this cake, and you wouldn't be able to tell me why. See, I know the answer to those questions because I know the person who made it. I know who, and I know why, because I know the person who made it. This cake, in fact, was baked, yes, from a box, by my nine-year-old daughter yesterday, <laughs> little Jane. And why? Because I asked her to. I said, would you make me a chocolate cake? I need it for church tomorrow. She said, sure, Dad, but will you bring it home? <laughs> this is a little bit like how we approach the first few chapters of Genesis. We read these opening stories, these opening words to Genesis, and often we come to the text with our own set of questions, and we want to know a bunch of the how questions. How did God create the heavens and the earth? Did it take him a long time or a short time? And how was there evening and morning when the sun wasn't made until a few days later? And we have all these analytical questions about how, and we miss the most beautiful part of those chapters, the who and the why. The most beautiful part of the story of creation is not the questions of how and what and those details, but really it's about who made the heavens and the earth and why. We're in a series here at New Life called Who is God? And we're going to spend several months talking about each person of the Trinity. We'll spend several weeks talking about the Father, and then we'll talk about the Son, Jesus, and then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. But here we are a couple weeks into this first section, who is God, the Father. And this morning we're gonna focus in on that attribute, that thing that we confess about the Father, that he is the maker of heaven and earth. Just as we sometimes come to the text with our own questions that we miss the greater picture the text is trying to show us, it's also true that we sometimes go to the wrong places with our most pressing questions. Science is a wonderful thing, and many of the, the history of the development of science actually springs from a deep faith in God. But there are limits to the kinds of questions science can answer. If you're the type of person watching online or you're here in the room and you've determined that you will only believe things that science can provide or prove, you'll find yourself being able to say, well, I know what the world is like and I, and I might even know how the world works, but there's some questions that you won't be able to have answered because science can't provide those answers. The late Jewish rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi in the British Commonwealth, he was famous for saying, science pulls things apart to show us how they work. And faith puts things together to show us what they mean. There are some questions that we have to look elsewhere if we want to get answered. How are we to think about this world? What does it all mean? Why did God make this? Why am I here? We have to go somewhere else with those questions. And the place that we go as Christians is to God himself and to his word. The early Christians, when they were writing down their faith and they wanted to put it down in writing so that it could be preserved and passed on from generation to generation, as we did this morning, they wrote, they met in the council of Nicaea, a little town, and, and, and they wrote out the creed. Maybe you've seen on our walls out here or on our website, it says the Nicene Creed. And maybe you're new to the church stuff and you're like, the Nicene, was that supposed to say niceness and they ran out of room somewhere for the extra letters? No, Nicene because that's the town where they wrote down the statement of the Christian confession of 
faith. And the Nicene Creed opens with these words. It says, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Genesis 1, 1 opens out, the Bible begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw, skip all the way down to verse 31. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Catch two things here. God saw some of what he had made and most of it was not bad. No, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Everything and really good. Two strong statements. In fact, if you read the Genesis story, God can hardly contain himself. He's interrupting himself. At the end of every stage of creation, he steps back and he goes, man, that's good. That's real good. I like it. I like it a lot. It's like an artist or a creator who's writing a song and he gets a line. He's like, oh, that's a good line. I like that line. Let's keep going. God keeps interrupting himself because he takes delight in the world that he's made. The ancients, the book of Genesis is written a long time ago, and the ancients, the people who were alive in that town, the, in that time, the ancient civilizations, they also had creation mythologies or stories. And they would not have asked, did a God do this? They would have said, which God and why? And when you read Genesis that way, you come to it with the questions that the text itself was designed to answer. And what you discover is the Genesis story is very different than the ancient Mesopotamian myths. Some of the, one of the ancient myths was there were a couple of gods at war with each other and one killed the other and ripped his guts out and flung it over there and that became the sun. Isn't that a lovely bedtime story? <laughs> Little Johnny, this is how the sun came to be. Another ancient myth says that the gods were tired of doing all the work, so they said, let's make these creatures and let's make them our servants. Isn't that dignifying? Happy birthday, you servant of the cosmos gods. You're like, oh, okay, thanks for that one. And all of a sudden against that backdrop, we have these stories that Moses by tradition writes down about the start of the world. And what Genesis reveals is the God of Genesis is a singular sovereign creator who makes the world on purpose and with pleasure. Every one of those words matter. Makes it on purpose, it's not accidental. And he takes pleasure in, moreover, he's the only one. You know, in the ancient world, they thought the sun was a god and they thought the moon was a god. And so Genesis one is basically Israel trolling their neighbors and kind of saying, y'all think those are your gods? I got a story, our God made your God, boom. And it's this, it's this way of saying there's only one. We sang it this morning. There's only one. There is only one. There is only one. The God of Genesis is the singular sovereign creator who makes the world on purpose and with pleasure. But what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for our knowledge of who God is? And what does that mean for the way that we interact with the created world, with the world around us? Not just mountains and rivers and seas, but human beings and friendships and Laughter, how do we engage with the created world? This morning I wanna say three things about creation that are worth reflecting on. If God the Father is the maker of heaven and earth, this is how we should think about his creation. Genesis 1 verse 31, we'll read it again. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The first thing I wanna say might seem obvious, Creation is good. Creation is good. Now this should be obvious. You're like, we just heard about it this morning, looking at Pike speak, like, yeah, we know. But think about what we've also heard. We also heard about hurricanes. We are also, we're also aware of the times when it seems like the created world is revolting. We're gonna talk later this morning about why that is. But the opening words of the story is not God looking at this world and going, oh my goodness, I gotta put up with that. The opening words is God blessing it and God saying, this is good. But you know what happens to us is we get kind of religious sometimes. We get kind of churchy. And so we start to think that like world is bad, church is good. And so every once in a while, this is, you know, sometimes people say this to me as a pastor. They'll be like, oh, I know that you guys were hosting that special speaker and that special event thing, but I ended up just having dinner with my neighbors. I'm so sorry. 
And I realized in that moment, oh, we've done a poor job of discipling you to recognize that wherever you find the goodness of creation, whether it's in the laughter and a meal with friends, that there is the goodness of God. Instead of saying, well, hang on, it's only good in here. we got to hunker down and let's close all the doors and turn, then make sure there's no windows and we don't want to see anybody and close your eyes and the, the, this is where, and we think that the only thing that is good is when we can kind of escape this world and go away to the spiritual world. But you know, it's not how the scriptures are. Look at the Old Testament. These people of God were not saying, let's just, just you know, pretend that nothing exists out here. In fact, they're living, essentially they're living in the outdoors, right? It's like how some of y'all spend June and July in Colorado, right? They're living like in tents and they're camping and they can't help but let everything around them remind them of God. And so you read the Psalms and they're like, oh, uh, your love, Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness is like the mighty mountains. Or I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Or they say, the Lord is my rock. Or they're out working in the fields and they're tending their flocks. And they're like, the Lord is like a shepherd. And they start to pull these metaphors and images from where? From the created world. Sometimes maybe you grew up in a kind of church that said the only vocation that was holy was if you were a preacher. Now preachers, you know, they're their own quirky special breed, but there are many vocations that can become holy vocations when you offer it to God. Creation is good. It means there's goodness to be cultivated in all kinds of work, in the care of children, in education, in healthcare, in all of the different ways that we make something of God's world. We are saying, God, you made this and you called it good, so I'm gonna work with you to bring out the good. What if you thought about your work that way? Instead of dividing it up and saying, well, the, this is bad, this is good. I think of the story of the Scottish athlete who was running races, Eric Liddell, and they said, how could you run races? You should be in church. And he said, yeah, but God made me fast. In other words, church isn't the only thing God made. He made me and he made me fast. And he said, and when I run, you remember this from Chariots of Fire? And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Creation is good. It's out there. All of the gifts that God has made are to be enjoyed. But it also means, friends, that you are good. Now, this one is maybe tougher for us to swallow because, if you know, you're like, well, don't Christians believe that, like, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and, like, total depravity and all of that stuff? Like, oh, I'm just awful, right? Don't we come to church every week to get beat over the head and reminded how awful we are? Isn't it something that the Bible doesn't open with the story of our failure? The Bible opens with the story of God's delight. Not the story of your failure, but the story of God's delight in you and in me. The Old Testament's written in Hebrew, but by the time of Jesus, it gets translated into Greek. And when you get to that end of Genesis 1, where God creates male and female, he says, it says, and God blessed them. And that word in Greek is the word eulageo, from which we derive our English word eulogy. It simply means God spoke well of the male and the female that he created. Now think about that. When do we give a person a eulogy? At the end of their life. This morning we were praying pre-service and Pastor Gabe Jenkins said, let's start to bless the people in the room. Who can we bless this morning? So people are saying, oh, I love so-and-so and I love what they do and I love this person. And it was just so encouraging because you know what you're doing when you bless a person? You're agreeing with God. Because in the beginning, before the foundations of the world, God spoke well of you. And yes, there's a story, there's sin in the story. Yes, there's brokenness in the story. Yes, there's rebellion and idolatry in the story. And we're gonna get to that this morning. But before any of that, God looked at you and spoke well of you. That needs to be a game changer in your heart. That needs to be a game changer in your life. And so I wonder this morning, could you just, Take like a few seconds and turn to the person next to you. And if you're sitting next to a man, say, you're a good man. If you're sitting next to a woman, say, you're a good woman. So but introduce yourself if you don't know him yet. And then look him in the eye and say, you're a good man. You're a good woman. That's how God sees you. That's how the Father made you. Amen? James 1, verse 17 
James says this, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift is from above. I know sometimes we stress out a little bit in life, we're like, should I thank God for that parking spot or should I thank God for chocolate cake or should I thank, you know? Is it a good gift? Then there's only one giver. And James says, if every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And so the second thing we say about creation is creation is a gift. It's a gift. It's what God has given us and gifts are meant to be enjoyed. Any coffee aficionados in the house this morning? You know what this is? It's a French press, that's right. You would think, that's obvious. Come on, Glenn, try a harder one. It's a French press, but my 23-year-old self did not know that. And so almost 21 years ago when my wife Holly and I got married, someone, a, a really good friend, really dear friend, gave us this. And we were like, we didn't register for this. Like, you know, you take all the trouble to register and then people give you stuff you didn't register for. Like, why do you do that? You know, but this, <laughs> some of you are like, that's a little too close to home. <laughs> But this is a good friend and he loves coffee. And so he gave us this, we're like, what is this? So for years, it just sat in a, one of our kitchen cabinets. I mean, we moved, we've moved houses like four or five times. We've lived in Colorado Springs for 22 years. We've moved, we put this in a box, moved it to the new house, unpacked it from the box, put it in the cabinet, never used it. Like, I, I don't know, do you know how to use it? I don't know how to use it. Okay, well, yeah. Until a few years ago, a few years ago, we were like, let's get out this thing. It's a French press. Let's figure out how to boil some water, grind up some beans, put it in there, let it steep five minutes or so, press it down. Now, this is pretty much the only way I have my coffee in the morning, pretty much. I, 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 you know, I can be taught. But the point is, <laughs> the point is a gift is meant to be enjoyed. It's not meant to sit in the cupboard. It's not meant to be put in the shelf. It's meant to be enjoyed. How many of the good gifts that God has made in the world around us that we're like, I don't know, should I, should I enjoy this? Is it okay to take pleasure in a meal with friends? Of course it is. Is it okay to enjoy this? Some, you know, again, sometimes some of you might have heard or grown up in, in places or environments where it was like playing cards is evil and music is bad and all of this stuff. And you're realizing, man, aren't there God's good gifts in the world? Well, if these are God's gifts, I'm gonna enjoy them. But it also means your life is a gift. It also means your life is a gift. Often it's easy to appreciate God's gifts everywhere else, but right here. And we sort of have the nagging voice in our head that says, I'm less than, I'm not enough, I'm just... Uh, and so we kind of run ourselves ragged. You know, one of the unintentional sort of effects of learning to do hybrid work and digital work and online work, one of the unintentional downsides to it is it put a, a lot of the focus on our productivity. And so whereas a normal, say, you know, eight to five work day, there would be some hours, don't tell your boss this, but there would be some minutes in the day, maybe, maybe hours, that are quote unquote wasted by just walking around and chatting, checking on so-and-so in their cubicle and chatting at the water cooler about the game last night and all this stuff. But with Zoom, it was just, we, could, we, we figured out we could schedule meeting after meeting after meeting. And there was no like in-between or pre-meeting small talk. It was just, uh, Susie, you're on mute right now. Could you just, yeah. So. <laughs> and we kind of lost the humanity of work and we turned ourselves into productivity machines. Some of you lost income this year. You felt the strain of that, that maybe your value to your family or to your home was the income you could generate pressures of this world are always trying to make us less than what God made us to be. And so work and the world around us sometimes squeezes you, you're a productivity machine. And the voice that shouts over those voices is the voice of the father that says, no, 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 you're my beloved child. You're my beloved daughter. You're my beloved son. You are not what you earn. You are not what you make. You are not how you, well you did last quarter. You are not the, the sales quota that you did or didn't hit. You are not the things you produce. You are the beloved child of God. Your life is a gift. So take a moment, 
Find that best friend sitting next to you now. Once again, you're going to be close this, this morning. And look him in the eye and say, your life is a gift. You are a gift. You're a gift to me. This could be awkward if you had a little fight on the way to church today. <laughs> Probably still need to talk about it, but this will help you. The, th the third thing I want to say is that creation glorifies God. Creation glorifies God. This world was not made as an end in itself. It was made to be a witness to God. We heard it this morning as Pastor Eddie was reminding us that creation is going to praise him. The question is, are we going to join in? I love that. He quoted from this psalm, but let's read it this morning. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Man, imagine having that kind of vision and imagination. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge and then the psalmist is like, okay, let's get real. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them yet, yet. With my prophetic imagination, the psalmist says, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. See, the truth is the goodness of creation reveals the goodness of God. When you see something good, you're supposed to say, oh, you know what? That makes me think of God. And the gift of creation reveals the generosity of God. We talked about the gifts of the science and scientific and researching community, but there's also the gifts of the gift of the artists and the poets in our community. The artists and the poets help us recognize that beauty is always excess. Beauty is always surplus. It's always more than what you need. I mean, the sun can go down without sunsets being beautiful. And the sun can rise without it capturing our breath. And birds can fly without singing. And yet they do. Beauty is surplus. It's always excess. And if we want to just be sort of miserly about it and say, well, I just, just do the, mere, the bare minimum here. Sometimes the gift of God is it's a way of revealing his very generosity. Some of you know this and you take a, your kids out, and you're like, you know what, we're getting Chick-fil-A milkshakes, not today, Sunday, but tomorrow. <laughs> and why, Dad, what are we doing this for? Just because gifts reveal the generosity of God, and all throughout creation, the gifts of God reveal his generosity, but you know what we do is we mess things up. Instead of letting creation glorify God, we glorify creation and forget about God. And I'm not talking really about rivers and oceans and trees and mountains. I don't think any of us are out there worshiping mountains. But it's the stuff in the created world. Book of Acts, Paul and, and Barnabas are ministering in this Greek city and their preaching is so eloquent. People are like, you guys are the gods. This is Zeus and, and Apollos. And, and, and Acts 14, verse 15, Paul's rebuking them. He says, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news. I'll never forget one time I was leading worship back at Old Roberts University and, and, I, and a, a, a older, sweet older lady came up to say, you know, great job, you know, up there. And I said, oh, it was wonderful though. Thank you so much. And she looked at me kind of surprised that I had said thank you for her telling me I did a good job. And she goes, <laughs> like, glorify God, brother. Anyway, Paul and Barnabas are basically saying this. They're like, hey, hey, don't, don't look at us. And then he's just telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them in the past. Paul says, he let nations go on their own way. God let human civilizations try to sort this out and wrestle through the rise of religions and rituals. But even so, Paul says, yet, yet, he has not left himself without testimony. God, God put some breadcrumbs down the road. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Paul's saying, look, don't look at the breadcrumbs and think the breadcrumbs are the feast. The breadcrumbs are supposed to lead you all the way home to the maker of heaven and earth. 
So you love your job, that's great. Don't stop and think that your job is your source of everything. It's not, it's good. It's a gift from God, but it's not God. So you've got friends that really help you find joy in this life, what a gift. But don't stop short and say, my friends are it. It's God who is the source of all of this. I mean, imagine, maybe a way to think about this is that creation, there's signposts that point the way. Imagine how foolish it would be to, on I-70, you see a sign that says Breckenridge Ski Area, and you're like, oh, ski, right here. Oh, here it is, I'm new to Colorado, here we go. Let's, let's pull over, and you pull over on the side of the road, and you get your gear on, like, what, are you, what is he doing? He's like, well, the sign says ski area. Like, it also says five miles. <laughs> like, not here, further on. Or say you get to go on a vacation, you're going to the beach, and you got your beach chairs and your towels and all this stuff, and you see a sign that says beach access, and you're like, oh, here it is. And you set up your chair right there. You're like, no, beach access means keep walking. It's right there. This isn't it. And that's the way we're meant to interact with the created world and the good gifts of people and relationships and meaningful work and, and delicious food and all of the stuff that we are to enjoy in the world. It's all meant to be a signpost. Enjoy it and then keep going. What's it pointing to? It's pointing to God. But when we take good things and treat them like ultimate things, we ruin everything. When you take a good gift and you worship it, you make it the center of your life. You've made your family the center of your life. You've made your career the center of your life. You take a good thing and you treat it like an ultimate thing. Guess what happens? You ruin everything. And this is what happens to creation. Paul says it in Romans 8. He says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. So when we hear of the earth breaking way and earthquakes, and when we hear of storms surging and systems working against us, we say, well, what's going on here? Creation is frustrated. It's raging under its own chains, not by its own choice, but by the one who subjected it. How? In hope. What's the hope, God? The hope is that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. One day, creation will experience the freedom that we are already tasting in Christ Jesus. One day, all of it will be made new. But if creation was made for glory, then it's also true that you were made for God's glory. You're part of this creation. You were made for God's glory. That means we're meant to sort of take every part of our lives, our, our work, our relationships, our money, our, our, our food, our, our plans, all of this stuff, and just say, God, this is everything that I am. This is some of the stuff I've cultivated from your world, and I am too part of your world, and I'm putting it now on the altar. I am for your glory. My life exists for your glory. But if the worship team would start to come this morning, I know there's an objection here. And the objection is, Glenn, that's nice if you had a clean story. That's a nice sermon if, my life, if your life wasn't messy. It's nice to say that we're good and our life is a gift and we're made for God's glory, but it sure doesn't feel like it. You don't know about the divorce. You don't know about the addiction. You don't know about the people I've hurt. You don't know about the shattered pieces in my wake. I do know that God is still the maker. You notice that the creed doesn't say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, who made heaven and earth. You notice it doesn't say it in the past tense. It doesn't describe an action. It's not a verb. The God who made the heavens. It's a noun. He is the maker. The maker. And here's why that matters. If he just made, then that's just an action he did. But if he is the maker, it means he can make all things new today. It means he can make your life new again today. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians. He said, if anyone is in Christ, come on, say it with me. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. 
The old has gone and the new is here. Some of you have never heard this news before. You're watching online or you're in the room and you you're, you're, you're sort of thought that the Christian message was try harder, do better, and maybe get a little Jesus dust sprinkled on you so that you can upgrade from 1.0 to 2.0. But what's on offer to you today is not an upgrade. What's on offer to you today is new creation. What's on offer to you is not a little bit of self-improvement, Jesus style. What's on offer to you today is for the maker of heaven and earth to make you again, to make you new again today. Now others of you, you're in the room and you're like, well, I've been following Jesus for a lot of years. It's great, it's awesome, love it. Me too. Paul says our outward being perishes, but our inner being is being renewed daily. You know who does that renewing? The maker of heaven and earth. The maker of heaven and earth renews our hearts daily. God, renew my spirit today. God, renew my heart today. God, renew my relationships today. See, church, because of Jesus, we can become a new creation now. Now, today. Again, so all over the room, would you stand with me this morning? We're getting ready to come to the Lord's table, but I want us to sing an invitation to the Spirit of God. Genesis says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the deep and the world was formless and void. And all of a sudden God spoke. This morning, Wherever you are in the journey of faith, we're inviting that same Holy Spirit to hover over our hearts, hover over our lives, and bring new creation. So we're gonna sing each of the three notes of this chord, and we're gonna sing these words, Holy Spirit, come. We're gonna sing it just like this. Holy Spirit, come. Try that with me. And we're going to go up to the third. Holy Spirit, come. Try that again. Sing it. Sing it. Holy Spirit, come. Now we're going to go up to the five. Holy Spirit, come. Sing that with me. Holy Spirit, come. Now pick one of those three notes. We're going to make a chord together in unity and harmony. Sing it now. Holy Spirit, come. Yes, Lord. Sing it again. spill over into your own words now. Begin to welcome the, the maker of heaven and earth to make us anew. Maybe the places in our lives that are dry, that are dying, maybe this is the moment to repent, to say, God, I'm sorry, I've made something else. I've made someone else the center, the, the source. I've made something else the sovereign in my life, and I want to turn from it. It's you alone, Holy Spirit, you alone, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all working together as the Creator, the Lord, the Giver of life. Come, Lord. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on now. Holy Spirit, come on. moments of this. Fill in the room with the invitation of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need you, how we need you. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you every hour. Yeah. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Father, Son, we need you, how we need you, how we need you. 
and he brought me with him. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Come on. He made me a new creation. All things past. Now I'm take your communion elements and begin to open them up this morning. We're about to come to the Lord's table. And this is the place where we, our story finds its center. And you're here this morning. If you've not said yes to Jesus, it's okay. You don't have to receive communion. But anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, you're welcome to receive today. In fact, this can be your first act of faith. I mean, think about it. That your first yes is yes to a meal with Jesus. Come on, that's it. So if you're here and there's something tugging in your heart, you're like, I don't know too much about this, but I want to say, this is your yes to Jesus. Come and eat. Come and join him at the table. Jesus, on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread. And when he had given thanks to the Father, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Hang on to it for a second. And after supper, Jesus took the cup of wine and when he'd given thanks to the Father, he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And you know what Christians have said throughout the centuries, right at this very moment of their worship service? They say, yeah, these are the gifts of God given for us the people of God. Because yes, the mountains are great, the heavens are cool, but there's no gift God has ever given us like the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, amen? And so we come to the table and we say, God, I don't know, I don't know if I can thank you for a job, I don't know if I can thank you, I don't have much else to thank you for, but I've got Jesus, the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. Receive it now by faith. To open up our hearts and begin to thank him now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
Listen, some of you, the Lord's not done working in your heart, and there's something you came in carrying. You want others to pray with you. We're the family of God here at New Life Church, and I want to invite our altar ministry team to be up here in the front to come and be ready to stand with you, pray with you, encourage you, remind you of who God is. And then others of you, you're new or newish to New Life. Out in the lobby is Connect Central. We'd love to meet you and help you find your place in the family here at New Life. Uh, there are section communities uh, that are having parties today. Different ones of you, section one in the activity center, section two in room 161. I want to pray a blessing over you this morning as you go. And then why not let's sing the doxology? Why not? We got 60 more seconds. Let's do that. Let's do that too. So Father, we thank you for who we are in you because of you. Now, Father, I pray that you send us out as lights in this world, people who can put on display. We are the creation that reveals the goodness of God. Let us be that. We can be the new creation that reveals the generosity of the grace of God. Let us be that. And we can be the new creation that glorifies God. Send us out in our neighborhoods, our homes, our schools, our classrooms, places of work, our communities. Do it now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sing this now. Praise God from Go rejoicing in the love of the Father and glorify God this week. Amen.